Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, just one more round of applause for the wonderful filmmakers of their films. So I know Andre said a little bit about Nosa. I just want to say my small, small part. I've known Nosa for a very long time. So I, I was actually in school with Nosa. And it's so interested in the whole theme of becoming. It's so, it, I think it, it perfectly describes how I've seen Nosa in his life. And it's such a beautiful, like, uh, you know, a flower blossoming into something really incredible. And one of my friends who's here today said something to me about, you, you should never test God, because God can make you see someone in one way, and you never know what their potential or what they might become is. So don't expect who you see today as one way, um, and expect them to, they might be something so, so different. So don't judge them in this moment, but look at their potential and find what they can be, the flower that's going to blossom. And that's what I see in Nosa. So seeing him here and doing what he's been doing, um, I was able to reconnect with him about two years ago, and he started telling me about his, his story and who he is now and, and what his life is like now and what he's created. And in terms of insp inspiring someone and speaking to someone and, and pouring into their life with simple words, and yes, he does use very uh, articulate words, which are fantastic, because sometimes you have to pull out your dictionary to figure out what he's saying. But he is one of the most inspirational human beings I've met, not just because of who he is now, but because of how he's blossomed. And just in terms of his products, how he's so meticulous with what he's doing, even in terms of curating this festival. And when he told me about the idea a, a year ago and wanted to do this as the second year that we're doing it, I've seen someone who inspires me to be better, to become the best part of me that I can be. And just looking at the filmmakers and all of your films, I saw, oh, no, don't get involved. Um, and looking at all of your films, I saw those themes richly come through. So the first question I'm going to ask this, and I will be giving the audience opportunities to ask questions. But the first question I'm going to ask your filmmakers is, what was the inspiration and the key messaging behind your films? So, Ryan, you've got the mic first, so I'll let you go. I was going to pass it to <laughs> Please, you don't have to pass. That's not fair. <laughs> um, I guess for me, the inspiration was... I say craftsmanship, but not just craftsmanship, the way we see craftsmanship. I think very often we see craftsmen and women as um, those who are um, craftspeople, but I think we are all craftspeople and we're, we're crafting a great life or um, not. And I think the film was, for me, an opportunity to just take chapters of my life and show the craftsmanship and how it has evolved. And that was what inspired Becoming. Thank you. Um, who wants to answer next? <laughs> and just say your name and just mention what film was your film as well so people know. Sure. Um, hi, guys. Uh, this is a beautiful event to be part of. So thank you for uh, letting me kind of participate. My name's uh, Gijo. Uh, mine was the first boxing film, the documentary. Uh, why did I make it? I was um, in a bit of a creative hole at the time. I was working in factual TV on a job which I wasn't really enjoying and I wanted to do something a bit more creative. Um, and I got together some, a little bit of money and some support, like a, a couple of hundred pounds, and rented it. Oh, well, I spent, spent it on some funky lenses. If anyone's technical out there, you might have noticed that it looks a bit weird, the film, the lenses I'd always wanted to shoot on. And I was looking for some kind of inspiration, I guess. I'd, I'd faced a lot of rejections at, um, with kind of funding applications for my own films. And then I s somehow stumbled across the story of failure and men striving to be powerful but having to deal with failure. And it came it kind of came out of the film, this message that whatever happens to us, especially in the creative industries, this last year has been like very rocky for many of us, that you have ups and downs, but it's kind of about how you frame it and what could be a failure to someone could be an opportunity to someone else. And it could be a chance to see where your limits are, where you want to go, how you want to better yourself. And that's what I kind of saw in the characters who were kind enough to let me hang out with them for a couple of days. Um, and yeah, that's a kind of small little passion project which I'm happy to share with some more people today. Nice, that's interesting, thank you. 
Um, yeah, first of all, obviously, thank you so much for uh, having my film shown amongst great company. Um, my name's Sam. I made the film Domestication, the one where there's the woman kind of in the vertical frames. Um, yeah, the, the idea for this was like, I always, like, I come from a background in illustration where we're often working with metaphor. So um, that works very visually, and this idea was very visual. And when I first thought about, like, um, how to kind of highlight relatively mundane things um, in a way that would make us look at them in a different way, uh, I thought, how about we just take the inside outside? Um, it was actually for an open brief called House. Um, and that's why in the interview I talk about how it relates to being a, a comment on how we live in house. Um, but one of the things I noticed as well, making the film and watching it again, in fact, um, is it's you can be very vulnerable when you're doing something that's unusual. Uh, and as like a creative, that's how you feel a lot of the time, um, especially when you're making something that I think is uh, like more true to yourself because you're kind of putting yourself out there um, and I'm sure all of these guys can agree with that feeling um, and it's extremely heartening when it resonates with anyone even one person so when you guys got in touch with me and were like oh we loved it and it really resonated with us it, it made me feel pretty damn good <laughs> so, thank you Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed all of the films, and I love the fact that we all get an award and walk away like we, we, um, we all won something. Um, this umbrella is as great as everybody said it would be. I'd ha I've heard about these umbrellas for a long time. Um, <laughs> genuinely, I have. Um, and so uh, what inspired me to make this the film? The film that I made was um, Masterpiece with the... Uh, five guys in the gallery space and I really wanted to make something that felt light-hearted um, that was uh, I have a lot of really inspiring very creative black men in my life and even just you know younger members of my family and just wanted to make something that felt like it was a reflection on the people in um in my life and uh, obviously it kind of came from personal experiences of exploring those kinds of spaces with those people as well and the kind of hilarious conversations that come up or just trying to analyze, um, yeah, whether it's in an art gallery or just talking about art in general. So I think for me, it just really, and it also came out of similar to what you were saying, Gijo, just having been through a lot of application processes and trying to go through the formal channels of getting shorts and things made and just thinking about like, okay, what story do I want to see on a screen? What would I like to watch? And then how do I actually achieve making that? And that was a one day shoot with minimal crew, self-funded, part funded by my sister who's over there. <laughs> I shouldn't forget to mention. So that, it it was kind of a... a all of those things rolled into one. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vincent. Uh, thank you guys for the invitation. They, they flew me over from Switzerland this morning, so thank you again. And uh, yeah, my movie is The Cook, and um, <laughs> I feel like you know it was for me somehow. Um, yeah. Uh, the idea was uh, just a moment I, I shared with a friend where we wanted to roll a joint and we didn't have a grinder, so we just <laughs> we we picked up a kitchen knife and and the the image uh, struck me and I, I thought let's do something with it. So I, I you know it, it 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 can it can ideas come from everywhere and then you have to work on it. So based on that, then it evolved into a script and and. And then on the question of of, on, of the message, I, I try actually to kind of stay away from, from responding to like, I don't want to explain my my film necessarily. And I think what's interesting with this one is that there's no dialogue. So um, the, the movie got quite a bit of attention on YouTube. And if you check it out, like people actually go crazy in the comments, fighting over what it means. 
And, and actually, I think it just shows that people uh, see themselves mostly and, and interpret the film uh, as um, how it touches them. So I guess I, the movie is what you see in it. And to me, I think it's the, yeah, the last shot um, with the main character looking at it, his hands. I think it goes back to what you were saying on, on craftsmanship and yeah, what you can do with your hands being creative. So yeah, but there's no right, right or wrong answer. I think you, I just hope you enjoyed the film and thank you again for inviting me. Thank you very much. Last but not least. Um, I'm Aquesi, uh, AKA Quest, and I'm director of the therapist. Um, yeah, where did, remind me of the question again? What was the inspiration right. behind the film um, and the themes? So the inspiration behind the film was actually lockdown when everywhere shut down. Um, and I'm sure we all can remember when like barbers were, sh well, everyone was shot, uh, shot, sorry. And um, I remember looking at myself over the weeks and just seeing myself get progressively, like my hairline was mad, which is crazy. So um, I phoned Nigel, my barber, and I was like, bro, like I know your clothes and I know this COVID thing's getting mad, but like I need a trim. And he was like, all right, I'm gonna send you your time. The door's gonna stay closed, but just walk in, it'll be open. So um, I kind of broke lockdown rules. Um, and then I remember it was like April and, and like, it was so cinematic. Like he had like the shutters down. It was like, it just felt like it was smoky inside. And then we had like this, this really dope conversation. And at the end, I remember looking at myself and being like, right, like I'm back. And then um, just be, <laughs> literally. Um, and then, yeah, it was just crazy. And I, I just remember being, I was like, you know what? This feels like a film. And then speaking to like a lot of my close friends, I realized that they had had that relationship with their barber as well. Um, and I've had the same barber since I was a kid. And the idea that like, really like, it just stuck close to me. So I was trying to think about, you know, what could I kind of, kind of how could I create a story around this experience? And then um, a year later, I had a day off of work. Um, and then like we basically got given a day and the day was like used to basically create something creative. Um, so I like wrote a script in a day and then it sat on my hard drive for like, I think it was about a year and a half. Um, again, was trying to get it funded, wasn't getting it funded. And then I went to a theater show at the Bush Theater called The Colonel Does Not Speak English um, by um, a playwright called Tanya Nwachuku. Um, and like, it was crazy. Like the stage was not too dissimilar to this. She just had like coffee beans. Like she had sound design and she was able to transport the audience from being in um, like Northwest London where her family's from to Nigeria where her, where her parents are from. And I was like, man, it's crazy what you can do with like just like the smallest amount of like materials. And I think from that, like whenever I watch something, I'm the type of guy to go home and open my laptop and be like, I got to cook. Um, so I was like, then I was like, what could I create that's like, that's, re that's really succinct, um, that doesn't require a lot of resources, went through the hard drive of notes and the therapist was there and then, yeah, we set a date and two year, two years, two months later, we shot, and then a year later, here we are. So yeah, that's a long, a long answer to a short question. No, thank, thank you. That was brilliant. Cool. Another round of applause for these guys. So, so you, you, you touched on something, and obviously, obviously, the very last piece was animation. Um, but in terms of looking at taking a small space, so obviously, on your you, you did it as well. Like you took this one very small space, and it's for both of you, so you can hold the mic still. So um, you, you took a very small space and was able to, to tell the story. Now, when you first was envisaging your idea and your storytelling, was the space different or was it, I'm gonna tell it in a small space and that's how I'm gonna do it? Shall I, okay. Um, it, it was a combination of all of the shorts that I was writing were really ambitious and would have cost a lot of money and or at least I just really needed um, some kind of like funding body to be behind it. So for me, it was uh, just, I worked with a, um, a really great producer on it, so I was really lucky, but um, the location, I th it, was so it was somewhere in East London, I can't remember, but I just, I just knocked on doors. Like I, lo I looked online and I was like, okay, what space could we, transform so that we could I, I think I like location scouted online and then just knocked on doors and said I don't have much money but 
this, I could give you maybe this amount of money and we can give you these credits and whatever. And here's the script. And I would send everybody um, the script and the kind of treatment and, and explain what I was trying to do and then offer them the best that I could and see whether they were open to it or not. So I think in part, the resources that all the play, the we try, I tried to select places that felt appropriate for the story, but I was also kind of limited to what I was, what um, resources people were able to, to give me. So it was a kind of combination of the two. And I think that sometimes when you're, especially in, in the beginning, where, you know, when you're creating things, you don't always have the luxury of saying, it has to be exactly the way I imagined it or else I can't make it. Otherwise, you might not make it. And there's a lot of compromise that has to happen even when there is money behind something. So I think that's a great thing to be able to kind of learn from early on of like, how do I make the best of what I have? Um, so for me, it was also, I knew I couldn't afford a location move because we only had a single day to shoot it and I can't afford to pay everybody for two days worth of work, only one. So all of those things were considerations into like how long the script is going to be, how many characters you have. So it's really not the best, for me it wasn't necessarily the the kind of perfect way of making the film, but it was at that point the only way I could make the film. And if it's the only way, then that's the way I'm gonna go. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my next question is gonna be to Nosa actually. Um, obviously, the, I, I normally ask general questions, but I'm trying to finite them. So this one is about the challenges of making the animation. So this is your first time. I know we spoke on the phone a couple of times about how many drafts and how many different times you went back. And this is what you decided to do for this year. What was the biggest challenge for you making a short film which kind of comprised of your story condensed into a short space of time with no dialogue as well? Yeah, it was difficult still. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I didn't know what I was doing and I had a deadline and I wanted excellence. Um, and we we operate with a budget in Osakari as well. Um, we make the best leather goods, but everything's still with a budget. And um, I would say the challenge is just expecting excellence from others when I didn't even know what that looked like. You know, so we went through several edits. I'm talking, if you want the numbers, 18 edits to get to this point and you know I'm telling my team it's not there I'm like what were you looking for what do you mean it's not there I'm saying it's not there and sometimes just sitting down to say let's do it together and along the line even learning how to do stuff myself uh, I kind of I've, I picked up some skills now myself so just to make it come together, I say so the biggest challenge is just with this film, really having that deadline, one in excellent, not knowing what we're doing, but at the same time, still trying to make sure the story mattered and just bringing it together, you know. Thank you. Uh, one of the, I think one of the biggest parts of being a, a filmmaker or a director is you take in the idea of being a visionary and within what you're saying, for example, there are a bunch of people who you have to try and lead to the vision. So in the difficulty of trying to explain, sometimes it's because there's things in your mind that you may be not able to articulate in a way because it's such, such a, a, an art, it sits in your mind in such an artistic place. And um, as well as being a visionary, what we find is sometimes after you make it, you start seeing things that you didn't envision until it was made. And that's a combination of several people. So going to um, your film, the boxing film, um, one of the things I noticed, there was a lady who said to the guy, don't worry, um, you know, there's ups and downs. You get knocked down and you can get up, right? Well, then when you were speaking, you also mentioned that you found some things after making, because it, obviously it's a very um, live experience because it's kind of documentary. And I, and I remember one of the, 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 the people uh, said to him, oh, you, you don't train hard enough, right? So in, in seeing that, and in, in terms of your experience as a filmmaker, did there, was there any inspiration for you in terms of your craft that you learned from making that film? It's a really good question. And 
I'm glad you asked it because, um, yeah, I, I learned a lot and the film is not at all what I set up to make. Um, the first minute or so, which is kind of more quickly cut and has like quite fast um, electronic beats and um, feels quite propulsive was my attempt to try and make like a, an Adidas commercial on spec and try and get extra work. Um, and I thought from the main interview which happens in the film, which is kind of the backbone, was filmed in a like a three hour day when I met them. And that was difficult. The main subject I thought of the film was going to be James, the, the person who owns the gym. And when I turned up, there were a few people around and a few people who kind of uh, resonated with me a bit more when I spoke to them. and those three uh, characters became the protagonists, but because I didn't know them, it, it made more sense for me not to try and pretend like I did and to try and let them interview each other and me kind of guide the interview and just see where it takes me. But at the end of that first day, I thought he was, I thought Fabio was going to win the fight. He was like 100% sure he was going to win the fight. Um, so a lot of the the next day when I came back for the tournament was about reacting and learning and then realizing the story was taking me in a completely diff different direction to what I thought. Um, and as that happens in real time, you're kind of having to pick up and identify a new path that could make sense as a story. And that involves maybe realizing there is an auntie who who is supportive and, and understands the value of failure and the lessons you can learn through that as opposed to someone else who you could focus on more. And at the same time, the loss was hard and loss is hard in general. So I think it was important to show like the the strain on his face, like the sweat, beads of sweat rolling down his face just after he lost the fight and someone coming and criticizing him, who I think was drunk at the time and how shit that must feel. Um, but very quickly afterwards, like 45 minutes afterwards was when we were outside again and he um, I mean, the, the video paused, but he goes on, the, the name of the film comes from something he says quite casually. He says, uh, we, win, lo we, we win, we lose, we move. Um, and for me, that was a lesson on a personal level because I needed to hear that. And that's what kind of clicked for me. And that's what I love about um, documentary films that uh, there's like a magic in discovering stuff that you never expected. Um, but yeah, I think whether it's scripted or whether it's any kind of collaborative, um, creative work, so much comes from paying attention to what other people are doing and how they're contributing and how that might make your vision better and just might take you on a very different journey to where you expected, but often that's totally worth it. Thank you. Um, I think Anosa and, and Ranyara hit on it perfectly. So in, in your film where the lady's outside and she's you know, doing things that, you know, people would see as odd. I think <clears throat> even as creatives, what you find is that sometimes the holding on to the idea of what other people are going to think of you and your work and whether you should do it or not because of perception can hold you back. And you touched on a theme which, you know, was very, very interesting to me because it was about doing things and knowing people are going to see you do it, but it doesn't really make sense in their world, but being comfortable with doing it. How would you say, even in, in terms of your filmmaking and your ideas or like how you view, view the world now that you've made the film, how would you say your perception and, and thoughts have changed about other people's viewpoints within your filmmaking? Um, or life in general? Life in general. That's broad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the interesting thing was the kind of arc that we went through with the especially with the first shots when we started doing it and then as we kind of got into the swing of things and started moving around and so I, I made this just with Anouk, uh, Anouk Juan who's the performer in there, she's a very talented dancer um, and performance artist and uh, so I had the idea and I had uh, concepts already in mind and then when we started talking about it and seeing how like more and more boring we could get basically rather than, we started out doing much bigger things like miming activities in the house and it didn't feel right because it felt too artificial and um, in a way she was more comfortable doing something that was obviously performance 
Uh, so when we start doing things that were like, you kind of had to go, what is she doing? That's a bit weird. You know, like where it felt more like just an, a natural activity. Um, she felt more vulnerable and we talked about it and I was like, don't, I don't want you to do anything that makes you feel uncomfortable, obviously, but like, um, she was self-conscious to begin with, but then after a couple of minutes of doing something, she, in her own head, was in a different space. So it did this weird thing to her where it kind of, it was almost meditative. It like transported her to like the first shot, looking in the mirror, uh, holding a dress against herself to see if it's, you know, right. And when she first did that, she was like thinking about people around her and you could kind of see it. And then we did a few more goes at it and she said, like, she starts to get into it where she was, she was, you know, just in her bedroom. She didn't even think about people around her. And I was thinking, like, from a creative process, that's kind of where you want to get to. Uh, you don't really want to be thinking, how is the audience going to feel about this? Oh, my God, is this okay? Is that guy really, like, going to, you know, think I'm cool? Um, you, you, you kind of got to get past through all of that, but you got to do it. You got to burn through it. Um, I don't think there's a shortcut to it. You just got to do it. And then when you do get to that other side, where you're just going, I really like this. It's like you were saying, I I like this. I found something I like. Um, that's when I think it's good, and you can move on. No, I, th I like that, and, and it kind of goes into your point about like let people decide what the film's about when it's like kind of abstract and kind of different. And my mum did. So if there's any producers out there. I'll tell you how I learned producing. I learned producing from my mum my because my mum used to go to the market and when we're in the market, she would be bartering and I'll be like, mum, they said it's four pounds. Can, they're not going to give it to you for one pound. And somehow the lady would come out with the item that she was asking for, for one pound. And I'll be like, oh, this is my mum. She has no shame. So then I, I realised, you know what? As I was growing up and I started, you know, as well as directing and producing, I was like, oh, it's the same concept. And it's like you going around and knocking on doors and going, oh my God, they're going to say something. I'm going to ask for, for something for free or for very minimal. But it's that same concept of just being able to go there and go, look, I'm going to be unapologetic about this, but I need your help, man. I need something. So my mom's saying, you will not eat if I do not buy this for one pound. So I know, I know what she was thinking. So anyway, so at this point in the time, I'm going to throw uh, the, the mic to the audience and get some audience, audience questions. So if you have a question for any of the filmmakers, I'm going to keep it condensed so you're gonna have to pick one filmmaker for your question when you do ask and um if someone can just pass the mic if you put your hand up and someone pass the mic around i'll ask a, a question to wasi and to to a kwasi and kwasi yeah, and i'll ask it to the vincent, vincent. i said one filmmaker you know okay one yeah. but it's a tiny one so keep it keep it short okay um <laughs> i want to know about the casting process for both of you because you didn't, okay. like, how was that for both of you? Um, casting, where do we even start? So it was actually, uh, so we worked with uh, Coralie Rose, who runs Road Casting. Um, it was actually really, I think, casting Jaden, who's the guy in the chair. Uh, that was, like, I think really easy because, like, there is an abundance of, like, young black male actors. I think they've got a lot of inspiration. But actually to, to cast a therapist, that was, like, really hard um, because dependent on how old you are like you know the way black people speak in the UK we speak very different um especially because that like, you're 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 in like your influences so what I but what I wanted is I wanted someone that was a lot older almost like a kind of like a bigger bro but like more like an uncle but not too much of like your uncle uncle if that makes sense so like I remember getting back like literally getting certain casting takes back and we just weren't able to find anyone that had that kind of right energy um, so, like, me and the cast and director, we were just kind of going back and forth. I think initially I wanted, like, Idris Elba. Obviously, everyone wants Idris. Um, and then I just got told, yeah, that's, that's not going to happen. But who knows, one day. Um, but then what we done was, like, what was really interesting was having the conversation with the cast and director about, like, how blackness changes dependent on how old you are and also what part of the city you're from as well. So it's like, you know, I find that, like, when black men are in their, like, you know, late 40s, they've got a bit more of like a Cockney kind of accent. Um, the younger you are, it's obviously like Emily English, I think the term is called, where it's like mixed language English. Um, so it was like, so we were going through like loads of different people. And then one of the guys was like, oh, like, have we looked at anyone from the top way? And at first I was like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> um, and then I looked and then when I went through top way, it was really interesting was that like, there was like all these actors that started like showing up that like spoke in the right way. Um, 
And I think like we, there was a few actors that came up and we, we reached out to a few of them. We saw Ash and then like, Ash as well. I think for me, what I wanted was someone that like was a presence, but also could kind of like, you know, be like, look like an actual barber. Um, so I was like, I think Ash, Ash looks like interesting. He's got like a very interesting look and with some glasses, he might fit the role. And then we sent him a message and then um, within half an hour, he sent the self tape back. And then, yeah, we got our guy. I think it was like, four days before the shoot. So yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. But yeah, that's my long-winded way of, of how, we got, um, how we got Ash, so yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I know one last question. Can, can I ask a question? You want to answer quickly? Or you, what is the last thing? Oh, sh sure, sure, yeah, that's very easy. Uh, for me, it is very intuitive. I just uh, look, there's a website in Switzerland with all the, the actors, uh, the website? Yeah. It's called comedian.ch. Okay, <laughs> Easy. <laughs> and uh, so you can just look at the pictures and filter them by age, and etc. And uh, I think I just uh, picked him like very easily because of the eyes or something. There was something weird about him and also endearing. And he was just... <laughs> and I, I never met the guy. He's from Paris. He was, uh, he's still in Paris right now. And uh, I just wrote to him and he showed up the, from Paris the day of the shoot. And it was just so easy. Uh, so I guess intuition, I would say. Thank you. Okay, next question. Hi, um, just a quick one. And I wanted to know because... Uh, who's, the, who's it to? You're going to find out, fella. All right. <laughs> so, and for me, when I'm watching these films, um, and I've learned some bits and bobs from some of y'all, but uh, there's, a, there's a high production value. So with that, I wanted to ask... Um, how you sought funding um, and if you are comfortable sharing what that budget was just because it looks great. So who is it to? This is to the panel, my love. I said one person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just pick someone random. Okay, I want to I wanna, I wanna know from Akwasi. Yep, one. Um, you got one more. Okay. Uh, huh? What was I, I don't know. I want to know my guy. My guy at the end. Okay. Yep. Because you were talking about posh lenses, so I want to know. All right. No worries. I think you said a couple of hundred, but I'll let Kwasi answer. Um, all right. So the initial thing we tried to do it for seven grand, um, which was ambitious. I feel like if we didn't have like issues on the days of shoots, we might have been able to achieve that. But we got. I think the total it depends. What it's a, it's a layered question, but. We ended up, because we'd done loads of marketing around it, I think it was like 24, 25 grand in total. Um, I think with filmmaking, you just have to just close your eyes. And it's, <laughs> seriously, yeah. Yeah, that, that bumps, because I think we wanted to really get it out there. And then, um, yeah, so I funded it. So, yeah, don't ever do that ever in your life. <laughs> so, yeah. He's, he self-funded it, you know what I'm saying? Got money. All right. Um. Mine was, uh, the production budget was around 300 pounds. Um, <laughs> and that was from, uh, there's an organization called Directors UK that were running a course that I was on that kind of uh, had exercises that we had to do. And that's how I started this project off. And then I wanted to keep it going for an extra day to, to make it into something just for myself. Um, with some lazy Uber rides at the end of long shooting days and film festival submissions, which are like, annoyingly expensive and feel like throwing money away a lot of the time. I think it went up to around like 500 altogether. Thank you. All right, who's got the next question for us? Hello, um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, so my question is for um, Nosa or Runyararo, whichever one of you wants to answer, um, but more specifically um, to Runyararo as well, because your film was about kind of like how art imitates life and life imitates art um, and my question to you both would be what do you want because obviously creatives we are now kind of like the equivalent of what carvings on stones will be for future generations what do you want future generations to be able to imitate from your art oh my god <laughs> Um, for me personally, I think I really love film because it's 
I think people have heard this before, but it is a portal into different worlds. It's a way to see other experiences that you might not live through day to day, or it's a mode of escape in some ways, or it's a way to... Um, for, I love the film so much, I kind of have a, uh, a film for every mood, to be honest with you. So I think, um, honestly, it's just creating something that can resonate with somebody. And if it's a comedy, it's just that brief kind of... Uh, relief and hopefully there's some relatability in there hopefully there's some um, yeah I guess just some a, a way to connect with with other people so like the way that I connect directly with an audience member the way that the audiences connect with each other if they watch it together you've got this kind of like shared experience so I think for me it kind of changes with every project actually I always have like a different hope or ambition for each different project and the way that I hope that people interact with it. But I think similar to what you were saying, everybody's got their own interpretation of it. You can't be in control of that narrative. So I think I can have my private hopes of like how I hope a film might resonate with people, but really I think it's up to them to decide how they receive it. I hope that kind of answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Marissa. I guess for, for me, uh, you know, we make leather goods, you know, so um, that's the primary thing we do. But I s always say it is we split our work into selling and telling, you know. Um, on one hand, we need to sell. On the other hand, we need to tell. And I believe everyone's got an opportunity to edit their story and present it as art for somebody to benefit from. So when we tell, um, that's what we try to do. Um, we have many opportunities where we sell our work and buy our bags and don't forget. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the whole point of storytelling for us and for me is to just to edit a great story and, and my life and the way I have evolved and the way my team is evolving and to present that to say, hey, um, you could do it too. You could do the same, you know. And yeah, that, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm really sorry, everyone. I know some people had more questions, but because of time, I'm just going to have to pause it there. But if we can just give another round of applause to the wonderful filmmakers. And any questions you have, you can ask after, like, you know, once uh, Andre leads us out. But I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you to NOSA. Thank you for the team. And just thank you for, uh, thank you to God. <laughs> All right, take care. Guys, can we give it up for Ade and our wonderful filmmakers. Guys, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I hope you have been inspired by these amazing, incredible stories and films. The journey of becoming is one that we're all on, and I can't wait to see where we all get along, especially, you know, for next year. Who's going to be here next year? And hopefully it's going to be a new color umbrella, because then I will get a new one. Guys, can we give it up for Nosa and the team? The team up there, can we give a round of applause to them? Our team over here, our videographers and our photographers, thank you very much. So we are going to head back into the other room. There's some wine, there's some drinks, so you can meet the filmmakers personally. And yeah, thank you very much. I've been Andre Spence. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.